Hi guys, welcome to our second episode of the ESS series uh, where we're going to be looking at topic two, so ecosystems and ecology. And this is when we start really applying the more theoretical frameworks that we went over last week to something more practical, so to ecosystems. Um, so in this topic, we look at the components that make up an ecosystem, how they interact, and kind of the laws that govern um, their interactions. Um, so let's get started. Um, topic two is quite a large chunk of the ESS syllabus with a lot of interesting concepts that they go over. We, because I want to keep this video short and sweet, uh, we won't be going over all of them, but I do want to give you an overall uh, kind of run through on what they tell you about in this topic. Um, so as I said, we introduce ecosystems and the kind of key concepts that underlie it. Um, and we begin by distinguishing between the abiotic and biotic factors that um, are at play. Um, we also go over limiting factors, so those factors that limit the number of a population, and we split those into density-dependent and density-independent factors. Um, we then also go over some concepts such as carrying capacity and population growth curves, which are actually important not just in ecosystems but in human populations. So shout out to topic eight that we're going to get to. Um, and we won't, go, we won't go over this together, but the IB do like to get you to consider photosynthesis and respiration. So the processes on how we uh, acquire our food and break the food down to get our energy and how plants make their food as systems themselves. So I wasn't lying when I said that in topic one, they like applying the systems approach to a range of different things. And then they also tell you about biomes, so similar ecosystems that share climatic conditions. Um, so then let's distinguish between abiotic and biotic factors that influence an ecosystem. I think that's the first important thing to do. And abiotic factors are the non-living factors that influence an ecosystem. So temperature, sunlight, pH, so essentially environmental factors that will influence um, how many organisms are in a population, um, how they're interacting, etc. Biotic factors are the living factors that affect a population. And they, this one is really interesting because they consider the interactions between different organisms as factors themselves. So we have things like predation, herbivory, uh, parasitism, um, that we will go over together in just a moment. So yeah, you can see how, that, how these two kind of categories or factors are very different, um, but both crucial to how an ecosystem would function. So let's go over the interactions then. Um, predation is when one organism hunts and kills another. Herbivory is when an organism eats a autotroph, a producer, and parasitism is a specialized type of predation where a small parasite, usually it's smaller than the host, the organism that it kind of leeches off of, and instead of killing it, um, it realizes that it's more advantageous to just slowly draw its nu nutrients and draw nourishment from its food uh, than to kill it. So it just lives on the host's body for a long period of time, uh, slowly weakening it. Um, we also have uh, disease, which is when caused by pathogen or microorganisms and uh, basically a disorder. And we've got two types of competition. So interspecific competition and intraspecific competition, inter being between species and intra being within the same species. So organisms of the same population, let's say. And one interaction that I find particularly interesting is mutualism, which is when two organisms of the same or different species are working in symbiosis to, it, to basically both benefit. So it's not necessarily cooperation where they're helping each other, but they're just both noticing that this task or this behavior is helping both of them. So here we've got ox peckers and rhinos. And what's happening is the ox peckers are eating parasites that we just learned about off of the rhino's body. So ox peckers get food and the rhinos get less parasites on their body. So they're both just um, benefiting from this interaction, which is quite interesting. Um, okay, so now for some definitions. I know that a lot of students hate the definitions in topic two. 
Um, but I think there's one mnemonic that at least helps me conceptualize them a little bit. So the five main definitions in this section are species, population, community, habitat, and niche. Now, a species is a group of organisms who can interbreed and produce fertile offspring, meaning that their offspring can also uh, interbreed. A population is a group of organisms of the same species living in the same area at the same time and interacting. A community is a group of different populations living in the same area at the, at a different at the same time. So basically, um, different species, right? Because a population is from an, a species. A habitat is an area where a species normally lives. And a niche, which is probably the most, the, the broadest and most interesting definition here, is an organism's role in its environment. So it, it basically describes everything the organism does, what it eats, when it's active, what it mainly competes with. Um, so it's a very interesting kind of description of, of an organism. And the way that I remember the difference between species, population, community, and ecosystem especially, are that they basically grow in level of complexity. So you start with species, which is kind of the simplest, and then a population is a group of organisms from the same species, a community is a group of populations, and then an ecosystem, which is the broadest definition of all, is the mix of the biotic and abiotic factors in an area. So essentially a community and the abiotic factors. And so I just remember that if you use the, mnemon the mnemonic species um, and you write it out like this, you can see that each subsequent letter describes an increase in complexity of the definition. Uh, I hope that makes sense. All right, so let's move on then to limiting factors. And a limiting factor is one which limits the distribution, so where they are, and the number of a particular population um, or species. Um, and typically what happens is a population or the, ra the rate of population growth will slow as the population approaches its carrying capacity. And here we reach a really important definition, not just in topic two, but actually throughout all of ESS, which is that it is the maximum number of organisms which an environment can sustainably support. And the reason I say sustainably is because if you look at this graph below, um, you can have slight overshoots and diebacks around the carrying capacity, but you can see that overall, because of negative feedback mechanisms, if you remember topic one, um, you stay around this equilibrium. Um, and that, yeah, that is the definition of carrying capacity. Another distinction I want to make um, in terms of limiting factors now is between density dependent and density independent factors. Uh, and what that means is that certain factors will affect some populations, ones with more organisms, more than ones with less organisms. And these are factors like competition, predation, and disease, which basically the more organisms you have in an area are more likely to be abundant. So disease is more likely to spread if you have more organisms in an area. It's more likely to be targeted by kind of predators. Um, and it's more likely to be competition because resources are, are lacking. Um, extremes of weather and natural disasters, are, on the other hand, are factors that will affect small and larger populations equally because they won't, they don't, you don't increase the likelihood of having either of them um, with a larger population. So that is uh, an important and interesting distinction to make. And that brings us to population growth curves. We've got the J curve on the left here and the S curve on the right, and they basically describe two different generalized population responses to a particular set of conditions. A J population growth curve shows exponential growth. So uh, the kind of ideal growth where you have no limiting factors, plentiful resources, and the population can just grow exponentially. The S curve shows logistic growth, which is kind of what more typically happens, um, especially with case strategies that um, we describe which is when in the beginning you have an exponential growth rate, but as the resources become more limiting and you have more competition, more predation, 
that the population size kind of levels off at the carrying capacity, which if you remember from a couple of slides ago, is the maximum number of organisms that an environment can sustainably support. So these are the two population growth curves you have to know. Um, and that brings us to just briefly mention energy flow in ecosystems. So if you remember from our first episode, we described the two laws of thermodynamics. And this is again, when we really apply it to the more practical level. So three definitions for you. A food chain is a sequence of organisms, each of which is the source of food for the next. So the first diagram here, just trees, deer, lion. Uh, a trophic level being the position that each of these organisms occupy in the food chain, in the sequence. A food web is basically interrelated food chains and it more accurately portrays um, kind of the complexity of real ecosystems. Because if you imagine um, if each organism only had one potential source of food, that wouldn't be very kind of efficient because if that source of food were to be unavailable for whatever reason, um, then we wouldn't fare very well. So I also want to tell you guys about three, the three most important players in the cycling of energy and matter in an ecosystem. Um, and those are producers, consumers, and decomposers. And they each have a unique but crucial role in the functioning of ecosystems. So let's describe them a little bit. Producers, or autotrophs, as is their scientific name, are the ones that have the ability to fix carbon or convert the carbon in the atmosphere into an organic form that consumers, we, can eat. Um, so they kind of provide full for all, food for all subsequent trophic levels. Consumers, or heterotrophs, are ones that don't have this ability. So in order to acquire their food, need to eat other organisms. Decomposers also cannot fix carbon, but what they can do is break down dead organic matter, um, and without them, the, all the nutrients and all of that energy would just kind of be lost to, um, in that form. So they are really important in this keeping the energy and matter cycling, which if you remember from topic one, is what makes up a open system. Um, and succession and zonation is the final thing I want to tell you guys about, um, just because it's such a big uh, kind of source of confusion. Um, so I, I appreciate it's a bit of a, a jump from what we've been talking about so far, but I just want you guys to be aware that succession describes how an ecosystem changes over time. Um, as you can see in the image below, after following a forest fire, you can see that how the community reestablishes itself over time. Um, and zonation is a very different pro um, kind of process because it describes how an ecosystem changes over a distance. Um, so over the kind of increasing height in the shore, uh, as you can see in the image on the right, uh, you can see how the communities again change uh, as you as you throughout zonation. So be aware that those two are two are very different processes, but that a lot of students get confused. And that concludes our topic two episode. So if you guys want to go ahead and click on topic three, I'll tell you a little bit about biodiversity.